Hello and welcome back to the Healthcare and Complicated YouTube channel. Today I have another magnificent leader and guest for you, but before I go ahead, let me uh, remind you to check all the previous content, everything to do with healthcare, amazing content there for you, and also subscribe to the channel and acknowledge our global partners. And today gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Rebecca Mahan, she is a, an associate professor of the School of Information at Kent State University and also an author. Rebecca, how are you? I'm great. It's great to talk with you, Jao. Rebecca, nice to have you in here. Um, the topic today we're discussing, making a difference in healthcare. And the first question that I have for you is, how do you think we can make a real difference in healthcare? It's uh, the golden question, Zhao. It's a great question. Uh, you know, initially when I, when I think about that, it's about engagement. And really when I, when I think more about that question, I have to come to it from with the lens of a health informaticist. So level setting, health informatics is using information and data to improve health and healthcare. So with that lens in mind, you can make changes uh, in healthcare as an individual and an organization. So there are different ways in which to approach this. Either way, I think the best solution here to achieve engagement is to use information to inform action. And the best way to accomplish that is through trust. I think you can't really move forward having information inform action unless you trust that data, trust that information. Whether you are you know, changing uh, your model of care from more of a traditional sick model to one of wellness and prevention, or whether you're creating treatment plans, you need to trust that the information coming to you to inform that uh, is, is the best way to engage. And really, you know, looking at this from other, multiple levels, uh, from a doctor's perspective, when they're using electronic health records or other health IT, they are needing to trust the information in front of them. We have the great opportunity to have multiple sources of data informing uh, the clinician's perspective, whether it's from wearable data coming in, uh, lab results uploading to that patient's record, or data entered by a care team member. The doctor needs to know, the, cl the clinician needs to know uh, where that data came from, what it is, when it was posted, really what the source is, is it trusted? so I can inform my plan. Now, from a patient's perspective, it's, it, it's also about trust. You might recommend that I wear, I use a wearable to monitor my blood sugar levels, to manage my diabetes, or perhaps that I download a mobile device to monitor my activity during the day or my sleep patterns. And I need to trust that that information is doing, or that, that device is doing what you said it would do and it's keeping the data secure and that it's only for me and to share with my care team. So there is a matter of trust there. The other part that is essential is that from the patient perspective, that that engagement with health IT, which can be a huge improvement in making a difference in healthcare, that it's easy to use and that I understand what you're trying to achieve there. So this speaks to the necessity to improve digital and health literacy so that I as a patient can engage uh, the way that you're hoping I can you know, from the clinician standpoint, because I know exactly what to do. I trust that device. It's easy for me to use it. And I think this is where we need to leverage our user experience specialists to come in and make sure that that information that we're sharing with our patients, whether it's discharge summaries, care instructions, or even the device itself, maybe on your Apple Watch, is, is easy to use because I might not have a caregiver at home. It's, it's might, it might just be an older adult uh, living alone and without the support of others. So they need to have it crystal clear about how to use that information and trusting that that information will get to my care provider. So all of those pieces about moving, using information to inform action through engagement <laughs> really relies on trust. And I think that's really one solid pathway to making improvements in healthcare. 
brilliant. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much. I mean, you really, really mentioned the most important things there. And you know, I'm heavily involved in um, in healthcare and I'm an advocate of wearables. When you mentioned wearables, I was always, always very excited and also very yep. interested. I also carried out a study a few years ago that we um, identified the user related, the technology related, the device related virus, but also the user related virus and the user related virus, it comes as a barrier on um, on the top, the um, trust and security and also yeah. the disengagement, in other words, the lack of interest from the patient. So you mentioned really important things there. Because I see a lot of people just focusing on the technology. And of course, technology mm -hmm. is very important because it brings the mm -hmm. data and connects people. But also, mm -hmm. there are very other important elements. And that engagement that you mentioned that everyone is kind of sometimes missing but trying to achieve is one of the hardest things. And you mentioned, in other words, the really important stuff that the simplicity, the communication, the understanding uh, to get mm -hmm. what we really want and inform people what you're trying to achieve because sometimes it's a blur about oh there is a device but people yeah. are not actually educated even on a basic level what is coming out of the device yeah and what they are expected to do so, exactly yeah. <laughs> so I, I think you're exactly right it is it is setting that expectation and and Zhao, i think you're pointing to the cultural change that needs to happen here so we don't just throw devices at people, yeah. <laughs> you know, it really has to be, you know, within a socio-technical context. So we have to appreciate that user, the, the, the society, the people using the technology and be clear about it, make it easy to use, make the information e easily understandable so I can derive the best benefit out of it. And that's what my clinician wants me to do. They want me to derive benefit out of it. So I think, you, you know, I agree with you that it really is part of the process. Yeah. Moving on, Rebecca, what innovative approaches can be implemented to ensure equitable access to quality mm. health care mm. for undeserved, underserved populations? Mm. You know, I think, uh, again, uh, an important question. I, In a nutshell, I think it is meeting people where they are. And in order to get that started, uh, I wanted to uh, touch back, we left an elephant in the room on the last question that, that actually sits here as well, and that is cost. I think we can't ignore the cost of healthcare, the cost of new technologies, and I think that speaks to your question here. Uh, so to address inequities, to, uh, to support communities that are underserved, again, first, we meet people where they are, and part of that, like I said, is cost. So you have to understand uh, what can people afford? When you prescribe medications, what, what is their capacity to pay for those medications? What is their capacity to use any health IT, wearable or device, or just get to the doctor? So first of all, we need to build education and awareness, helping people to understand where are the communities that need the most help. Next, it's about bringing the care to them. Um, and that could be achieved in a number of ways. It, it's around transportation. Uh, it's around co-location. So you think about uh, situating clinics or healthcare facilities in communities that are underserved uh, and really having a strategy about approaching that. Or you could be uh, use, using vans or transportation to go and get patients and bring them to you. But it is about reaching people where they are. Uh, this is also uh, involved in policy and city planning. I think it's important uh, for a community to understand, are there food deserts? Are there opportunities for citizens in that community to walk safely in that community to get food, fresh food and vegetables, uh, fruit and vegetables? Is it a walkable community? Is it safe? Uh, I think consumer health organizations are, are helping us lead the way here. And you think about whether it's a CVS Minute Clinic or something like that, or perhaps even Walmart Health, uh, where you they're situated in more rural communities or they are bringing healthcare to where people are. Again, meet people where they are. They're going to the, <laughs> to the Walmart. There's opportunity for primary care should they choose to use that. Another organization I think about uh, when you ask this question is Oak Street Health as an example hmm. here in the United States. And they, they're just an example of 
using um, and building healthcare clinics in communities that are underserved. They identify that right away, they build the clinic there, and <laughs> they leverage transportation. They send a van out to get their patients to bring them in for uh, visits. Uh, they also can send an Uber or Lyft if that's not available. But again, the emphasis is on recognizing, realizing that people are underserved and meeting them where they are, coming to get them. You know, this is also, um, you know, again, trying to address this problem from a digital or from a health informatics perspective, we are doing, I think, a very good job in identifying social determinants of health uh, in the ICD-10. So having a coding structure in a visit to at least uh, capture data that acknowledges someone's personal experience if they have are suffering with food insecurity or instability in housing, transportation. It's important for your clinical team to understand more about you and understand that that's a context in which you live. Um, now, I think we it's great that we have that, one area that I want to see improved is I want I would like to see a better strategy about using that data. So we collect it among so many other bits of data or amounts of data. But what can we do strategically to help the underserved community? So I think there's lots of stride there, you know, many strides we can make to uh, improve someone's condition by analyzing that data for informed strategy. I, I will come back and say that, you know, again, when you are meeting people where they are, trying to serve the underserved and make it more equitable, we can't ignore again, digital and health literacy. Again, make it easy for people to understand what you're trying to achieve, why you're doing it, and make it easy for them to be engaged in that process. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Rebecca, you really mentioned some very important uh, points there for, of course, better access and cheaper access, yeah. and more quality, yeah. and the lack of, um, education it always comes up because it's, it's yep. the missing link in health and i've been in health for over 20 years and and we we talk a lot about preventative health but it's very difficult because we miss the link of the health education but the organizations and the examples mm -hmm. that we give are very powerful because they have the logistics in place they have yeah. of course the locations and they have the shops and all the uh, all the things that people need to be closer to to the healthcare. So that's that's really great. And uh, moving on again to the third and last question is in your book, Making a Difference: uh, Careers in Health Informatics. You really address many many topics. Is there anything that you would like to highlight? Thank you, Zhao. I you know that the book has been a great experience. Uh, my co-author is John Sharp. Uh, he and I, he's fantastic. Uh, he and I are both faculty members here at Kent State University, where we have a, a master's program in health informatics. It's 100% online. We've recently actually been accredited by the uh, KHIM organization, which is the accrediting arm of the American Medical Informatics Association. So we're following those foundational domains and competencies for health informatics professionals. You know, the book, was inspired by our students. And so we've been here, uh, you know, over a decade now, uh, listening to very good questions, important questions from our students who ask, what is health informatics? How can I get involved? Uh, what jobs are out there in this field? Uh, what would you do every day? Or perhaps you know a little bit about informatics, but you don't know how to get started there. So this book, the goal of the book is really about helping people move forward, getting unstuck. Sometimes in our career, Zhao, and I don't know if you've experienced this, there's opportunities where we don't, where there's a moment of getting stuck, not, not, you know, you're not sure about how to move forward, which way to, which path to take. And that's the, you know, that's part of the inspiration for the book. And it's really, uh, really the, the goal becomes lighting a path for readers to get to the, their, their role in the health informatics field. And we approach that uh, really from a clinical standpoint and a non-clinical standpoint. You do not need to be a clinician to be part of the health informatics professional community. And I, the book highlights career paths for both clinicians and non-clinicians. So our clinicians, you know, we have, we've met so many wonderful people who've been uh, developing their subject matter expertise in bedside care. And so they have, you know, many, many years of bedside care 
whether it's an ICU or in a pharmacy, they have expertise there, but they're looking to make a difference in healthcare by applying analytical skills. They just want to make a job change. You know, it's time for a change and they want to use that expertise and apply it in analytics. And this is a great opportunity for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, and others to do that. Now, this does not ignore the non-clinicians. We have a great group of people uh, and interested parties who are coming to us from project management, or uh, there could be analysts in bank banking or finance. They could be managers in other realms. They have identified perhaps that it's time to make a job change. And they often come to us, Zhao, talking about how they do want to make a difference in healthcare in particular. And can I apply my skill set in project management and analysis in healthcare? The answer is yes. Uh, and again, we focus on helping you light the path to find that how you're going to enter that field. You know, obviously there are many ways to engage in the field. The book looks at six different domains in which you might be um, able to work. And certainly hospitals is our anchor uh, position where you find a lot of opportunities for informaticists. Again, that informaticist, no matter what domain you work in, tends to be the translator, right? Between They sit between the technical experts and the clinical experts. So the informaticist speaks both languages and is able to translate and communicate back and forth between the two. So we make sure that we're clear about what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to get there. So we, we certainly explore career opportunities at the entry level all the way to executive. And we also talk about um, a day in the life. What kind of work do you do every day? So we the book is um, incorporates interviews with, uh, with professionals. So in long-term care, in health IT organizations like electronic health record software development companies, uh, also in payer organizations and insurance, consulting, government and research. So there are many different ways to uh, consider it. I think a takeaway for the reader is that you have options. You know, there's not one way to approach this field and the field needs us. I mean, e even in the spirit of our conversation today, right? So we need, uh, we need smart people to be uh, improving health and healthcare, making a difference in health and healthcare. And we have, you know, from our students, certainly, and the people we've talked with for the book, we know that this is happening. Uh, we know that uh, there's a need there, that the industry is growing, and there's a great opportunity. I think overall, again, students have options in this area, or readers have options. We want to encourage people and remind them that they can make a difference. And the book just lights a pathway. It lights a pathway for you to get started. Oh, brilliant. Rebecca, thank you so much. Um, let me congratulate you on your the book, but also on, the, <laughs> on your work, you know, but it's, it's brilliant. I like what you said about the options, but also about you don't need to be a clinician. Many, you know, I do some keynotes around the world on wearables and digital health. And sometimes I get the invites starting like by Dr. Joao book, because I'm not actually a clinician. You know, right. but I've been in the yeah. field for a long time. People make this assumption that you are, yeah. because I'm in a medical field that I'm a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, but I've been in the field for a long time. But Rebecca, thank you so much. This is a fascinating conversation. We could talk for a long, long time. <laughs> uh, we really could. We really could. I appreciate that, Zhao. It's so no. nice talking with you. It's so nice He's talking with you about that. We come to the end of the interview. I, I have one last little question. I expect okay. a short answer, but is related to the channel. Is <laughs> How can we make healthcare uncomplicated? Ooh, yeah. Well, that is the task, right? So easy to use, improving literacy, health literacy, digital literacy. We need to approach this in a very simplistic way. I think to make it uncomplicated was your question. Come back to the reason why we're doing it. I think you need to, ex no matter if you're a physician, a therapist, in, in uh, a counselor, in whatever way you're working with a patient, talk to them about why you're doing what you're doing. And the patient needs to be honest about approaching healthcare. Why am I engaging in this wellness path? So come back to the why and have teams working with their user experience teams, your health communication teams to make it simple. I think that's the way we, that's the way we have to proceed. Fantastic, a fantastic way to uh, round up. Rebecca, once again, thank you so much for this brilliant, brilliant uh, input um, and your uh, great work. 
Um, nice to have you here. Thanks for accepting my my invite. It was a truly, truly dynamic interview. It was brilliant. Thank you so much, Zhao. It's my honor to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to round up now to all our viewers and listeners. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, connect with Rebecca. Ask her questions about the industry, the book, health informatics, anything that you feel valuable. I'm going to post uh, Rebecca's socials in here and acknowledge our industry partners, and I'll see you all next time.